Uh, that's First Timothy chapter 6, starting on verse 1. Let all who are under a yoke as slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Londoners are Britain's unhappiest commuters, reported fitness company Peloton earlier this year. Uh, the average commute is less than half the distance of our colleagues outside of the capital, and yet it takes 20% longer to get to our workplaces. Uh, Londoners are about 50% more likely to say that they absolutely hate their commute. And having squeezed onto the central line at rush hour a couple of times, I absolutely understand why. Uh, if that's your commute, I am very sorry. Uh, maybe like me, you share a packed cycle lane uh, with dozens of people who seem to be dressed for the Tour de France. Uh, maybe your mornings are gridlock in the Rotherhithe Tunnel. Uh, I know for some lucky people here, uh, commuting is as simple as rolling out of bed and opening up a laptop. Uh, unless you're somebody who zones out on your commute, if you do have one, uh, there are probably a million things going through your head. Um, but here's a question. Do you pray? At work is often where we meet the most non-Christians. It's where we'll come across the greatest stresses and temptations, perhaps. Uh, if we're here as Christians and we care about godliness and about other people being saved, as Paul would have us do in 1 Timothy, uh, we need to think about how to be Christians in our workplaces. Uh, we probably, on our commutes, need to pray about it too. And so... What does godliness look like at work? Well, in our passage today, Paul has something very simple to say. It's not all that the Bible has to say about work, but it's all that Paul wanted to write in 1 Timothy. So we'll go with that for now. And Paul's headline for godliness at work is this. Honour your boss. Honour your boss. Uh, by the way, if you don't have a boss, if you're self-employed, unemployed, or work at home looking after your family, please do keep listening. Uh, Paul intended every part of this letter to be read by the whole church family. Uh, even if it's not about your situation, uh, Paul wants to train you in godly thinking. It'll help you to pray for those who do go out to work or to school. It'll help to encourage them um, when it's tricky. So do listen in. Uh, let me read 6 verse 1 again. And let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honour. Uh, Paul is addressing the workers in the congregation at Ephesus, uh, the bondservants, uh, that is the slaves. And his message for them is simple, uh, honour your boss. If you want to be a godly member of the household of God, respect your master, uh, listen to him, do what he says. Uh, slaves at the time had a reputation for laziness and rebellion, uh, but Paul says, no, godliness doesn't look like kicking off or slacking off. It is very simple. Uh, godliness in the workplace looks like recognizing your boss's authority and being a good servant. And now probably two things have popped into our minds at this point. Uh, hang on a moment, we say, uh, one, slavery is awful. Can we talk about that? And two, I am not a slave. And to both of those things, I want to say, yes, absolutely. Uh, let me give a bit of context here that might help us. So about 25% of the population of Ephesus would have been slaves. Many households would have had a domestic slave or two. The very richest, the senators, would have had dozens or even hundreds. Uh, there would have been a lot of slaves about, uh, particularly perhaps in the church community. Uh, but slavery, as the Romans and the Greeks practiced it in Jesus' day, was quite different to the transatlantic slave trade that might come to our minds um, from our recent history. Um, obviously, there are similarities. Uh, slaves had to live where they were told and do what they were told. They had few rights. Uh, they were counted as property. They couldn't use the justice system, and if they ran away, they were subject to seizure and returned to their masters. But for the most part, slavery in the first century, at least in the cities, was very different. It wasn't class-based or race-based. 
Uh, you couldn't actually, when you were walking around Ephesus, uh, tell the difference, for the most part, between slaves, freed slaves, and freeborn, at least not at a glance. Some were born slaves, some were prisoners of war, uh, some were kidnapped, but others uh, chose to sell themselves into bondage in times of hardship. In cities like Ephesus, there were slaves in loads of different roles. Uh, cooks, cleaners, doctors, tutors, business managers. Uh, some were even paid or lived in rented accommodation outside of their master's house. It really wasn't uncommon uh, for masters to loan trusted slaves some money uh, for some sort of side hustle so that they could eventually buy their freedom. Uh, and many slaves were freed voluntarily by their masters after a time of good service. Uh, so the situation that Paul is speaking into is different to the one that we might assume. And his response, too, is more nuanced. He, he doesn't call for the immediate end of slavery in Ephesus, uh, and many throughout the years have struggled with that. Uh, but Paul clearly does recognize the burden of slavery. Uh, in verse 1, he calls it a yoke. Um, for those of us who aren't farmers, uh, that's the piece of wood that oxen wear to drag along their cargo. Um, it's a yoke, it's a burden. Uh, Paul lists enslaving, uh, stealing people for slavery, um, among a list of terrible sins in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, that is, stealing people to sell them. Clearly, Paul would condemn the transatlantic slave trade of our recent history, um, which relied on kidnap. And elsewhere in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, we read Paul encouraging slaves to seek their freedom if they could, uh, but not to worry if they didn't have the opportunity because you can serve God equally well, whether you are a slave or free, in the eyes of man. Paul isn't saying that slavery is fine, but nor is he starting a petition to abolish it. He's speaking into a pre-existing social situation and helping Christians of all types to be godly in it. This is the way the world is. Let me teach you to be godly. Those of us who are contract workers, we aren't slaves. That is also true. Uh, but there are some clear parallels uh, that make this passage and should make this passage very helpful for us. Um, if we're workers, uh, if we're students in a school, uh, we are those who work for another. Uh, we have a boss who has authority to tell us what to do. So Paul's exhortation is for us also. Uh, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honour. If you're in the workplace, if you're in school, respect your boss, respect your teacher. Honour their authority and position of leadership. Listen to him or her. Don't join in with the disrespectful chatter that goes around the office or around the classroom. Make obedience your basic posture. Be a good worker. Honour your boss. Now, I'm sure that's challenging for many, and all of us, I'm sure, can think of ways that we fall short in this area. But we can't stop there. It's important that wherever in the Bible we get commands from God, they almost always come with explanations. God very rarely merely tells us what to do. He explains why. He explains why he has made the world this way. He explains why we're being asked to do these things how it fits into his plans for us and the world. If we just take the commands and leave the rest, as I used to do in my quiet times, we will just end up weighed down. Like pulling a burnt out car chassis from a scrapyard, filling it with your luggage and expecting it to just drive away. Um, it's not going to work. We need the engine, uh, the motivation, and there are two in this passage. Here's the first. Honour your boss for the sake of God's fame. Honour your boss for the sake of God's fame. Now, that's the rest of verse one. Let's read on. Uh, Regard your master as worthy of all honour, he says, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. As Christians, all of us represent God to the world. Uh, people make judgments about God uh, based solely on how they see us Christians behaving. If we behave poorly, it will reflect poorly on Jesus and on the gospel that he speaks of. 
I grew up here in England, uh, and sadly, the English don't have a great global reputation. Uh, during the Euros, a squad of special football police uh, have been deployed from the UK to support the German authorities dealing with rowdy England fans. A few years ago, somebody surveyed lots of different countries to find the tourists with the worst global reputation. And surprise, surprise, English tourists were spectacularly unpopular in Germany and in Spain. Amusingly, 60% of Brits also think that we British make the worst tourists as well. <laughs> and now, being English doesn't make you a football hooligan. If you look at the national curriculum, I'm assured there is no module on rowdiness and binge drinking on Spanish beaches. But the poor behaviour of some reflects badly on our nation. So it's not hard to imagine what people might say in Ephesus if Christian slaves didn't respect their masters. What they say, this Jesus, he makes rebels. At this newfangled Christianity, it spoils the social order. Uh, this God makes for terrible, lazy workers. So too in our workplaces and our schools, if we are lazy, argumentative, unreliable, disrespectful or disobedient, uh, people will take one look at us and think, oh, this gospel he's always on about, it just doesn't make a difference. If that's what she's like, I don't want her God. Now I'm sure I'm not alone in finding that a little bit scary, the fact that we carry around God's reputation with us. Uh, but there is a wonderfully positive side to it too. Because bound up here um, in this passage is a reminder of our purpose in the world, our mission. Uh, the reason that our behaviour matters is because the God of all creation has put his name on us. Uh, people associate us as Christians with the name of God with Jesus. Uh, wonderfully, God has taken weak, sinful, and spiritually dead people like you and like me and like Paul, and he has raised us to life in Christ. He has brought us into his family. He's pointed at us and said, he's mine, she's mine, and him and her and her. He's gathered us together as a church family and said, this is my family. This is the family of the God of all creation. And I am absolutely fine with you looking at them, with the world looking at the church and saying, that's what God is like. He's absolutely fine with the world looking at us, the church, and making judgments about him. And in doing this, God has involved us wonderfully in his plan to bring salvation to a dark and dying world. And Jesus wins us for the sake of God's fame. So as we speak about Jesus, as we grow in godliness to resemble him, uh, we tell the world what God is like. And uh, we do it so that more and more people might get to know and start to worship the God who made them. There are plenty of resources around St. Helens um, to help us live as Christians in our schools and workplaces, especially those to hold out the gospel. Uh, lots of the city ministry does lots like that. Uh, ask me or Ralph or Anarin uh, if you want to hear more about that. But if we're ever going to use those resources, if we're ever going to invite our friends to guest events, if we're ever going to do any of that, we first have to have our hearts and our priorities changed. That's what Paul's doing here. Uh, we need to see how incredible it is that we have been given this starring role in God's plans. In this mission, God's glory and the proclamation of the gospel, Jesus has given us something far more important than even our personal freedoms. That's why slaves are going to make these decisions. The gospel and God's glory is so central that Paul could even here exhort slaves to cheerfully and willingly submit to bad masters. It's so important, it's so central that we might endure and even honour bosses who we wouldn't choose. Uh, all for the chance to show off Jesus and to give others, or perhaps even our boss, the chance to hear about him. Of course, there are some situations where we won't be able to obey our boss. If they ask us to sin or to act in ungodly ways, uh, to lie to our clients or to HMRC. If they make it borderline impossible to gather with God's people, 
uh, despite our best efforts to be flexible and say, you know, make up the time at another point in the week. Uh, there might be some situations where it's impossible to obey him or her, uh, but our basic posture should be honour and obedience uh, because we care about something greater than our personal comfort. Uh, why are we in the workplace? Uh, not for our comfort, not for retirement or fulfilment or status, but for God's glory, his fame. Uh, Honour your boss, says Paul, for the sake of God's fame. Uh, that's the first motivation. Uh, and here's the second, more briefly. Uh, Honour your boss for the good of God's family. That's verse two. In verse two, Paul turns to consider those slaves uh, with Christian masters, verse two. Uh, Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Uh, Wonderfully, the gospel spreads among rich and poor. In Ephesus, it seems, God had saved many people, a whole households, the free family, and their slaves. Uh, But of course, that creates complications. What do these new household relationships look like? I don't think many of us here have Christian bosses. Some of us do. Uh, But I'm sure that lots of us would love to. Uh, We hosted a guest event here last Tuesday evening. And I know that some of us were inviting our bosses as well as our colleagues. And now imagine your boss, if you have a boss or a teacher. Imagine they came along to an event here at St. Helens. Imagine they became a Christian. Imagine they joined our church. That would be absolutely wonderful. But if that did happen, uh, Paul warns us of a temptation uh, to disrespect. Uh, I think the logic goes something like this. Uh, My line manager, let's call him Nigel, uh, he's become a Christian. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, This changes everything. Uh, But at church, we talk about our struggles and our sin. We hang out with family. Uh, Nigel's my brother in Christ. So perhaps it's fine if I rib him more than others at work. We're family after all. Oh, Nigel won't mind if I'm late with this project. Uh, He knows I had important church things to do. Uh, He'll forgive me. He'll understand. Oh, it's fine if I mouth off about him to people in the office. Uh, He's family. Uh, Don't we all moan about our siblings from time to time? Uh, But suddenly, as if by magic, uh, you are no longer honouring him as your boss. But Paul says no. Uh, Precisely the opposite should be the case. Uh, We should serve better uh, because he's our boss and a brother. So imagine that happy day when we get a Christian boss or our boss becomes a Christian. Of course, the very first thing we'd do is go into our phone contacts and update their contact card. Uh, Who wouldn't? Uh, So we click on it and it opens it and it says, Nigel, open brackets, boss, close brackets. Uh, He saved it that so that if he calls up, you you wake up a bit when it flashes up on your phone screen and you know that your boss is calling. Uh, The boss is calling, wake up. So you click edit. Uh, But rather than deleting boss and writing Nigel from church, we're to add something. Uh, Nigel, boss and brother. Uh, Those of us with Christian bosses, we shouldn't expect special treatment. Uh, That all of us, that boss and worker, master and slave, are part of God's family is more reason to honour your boss and work hard, not less. Uh, Again, this is wonderfully positive from Paul. If you look at the end of verse 2 again, uh, those who benefit from their good service are believers and beloved. And not only are you honouring your Christian boss to glorify God, but also your hard work benefits God's family. He has an easier time of it. You work hard. Your Christian boss hits his sales targets. And maybe both of you get a bonus to share with the rest of the church. I'm sure there are many other benefits we could think of. Paul isn't saying you're a slave, you're a worker, you're his inferior Uh, That will never change. Obey the social order. No, Paul is recasting the slave and today the Christian worker as somebody who can serve and bring benefit to his master, who can serve wholeheartedly and with joy and really make his life better. Of course, this challenges our selfish attitudes, doesn't it? 
It might even challenge our attitudes to God's family. Do we really care about serving our family beyond a few practical jobs at church on Sunday? If you have a Christian boss or Christian team members, you are very privileged. In a sense, as you serve them, you get to be part of the family business. That work that you do not only glorifies God, but it benefits God's family. Honour your boss for the good of God's family. So for those among us in the workplace or in schools with teachers, uh, living out these two small verses are going to be tough. Uh, Godly relationships with bosses are tricky at the best of times, uh, let alone in times of stress. It would be easier, wouldn't it, if being a Christian freed us from these sorts of responsibilities. But godliness in the workplace, particularly honouring our bosses, it's worth it because we have a greater purpose than our own comfort or satisfaction. God has put us in the world, in his family, and yes, in the workplace too, for the sake of his glory, his fame, his gospel going out in all the world. That's why it's worth it. So as we think about that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us the incredible privilege of holding out your gospel in the world. Please help us to care most about your glory, your fame and your family. And so please help us to grow in godliness in our workplaces and in our schools. In Jesus' name. Amen.